I never thought about the universe, it made me feel small Never thought about the problems of this planet at all Global woman, radioactive sites, imperialistic wrongs, and animal rights No! Hey, it's June 15th, 2015, and this is the Bill Quinn Podcast. Uh, this is episode three of the Impact Network. So today I'll be speaking with the executive director of the Impact Network, Rashma Patel, about her organization. Now, they're based in Brooklyn, in New York, but their work happens in Zambia and Africa. Specifically, they're an international education nonprofit. So they are operating several schools over there and doing some things a little differently than the standard school and getting great results. So we'll talk a little bit about what's happening for most students in most schools and how her schools are a little bit different. And then we'll talk a little bit about how if anyone's interested to get involved uh, with the organization, there are a lot of different ways of doing that. And with that, here's my interview with Rashma. So I'm uh, here with Reshma Patel, who's the executive director with the Impact Network. Tell me a little bit about the education system in Zambia at the moment. What is kind of the situation on the ground? And, and, and then we'll talk a little bit about what your organization's doing to, to support the education. So, so in Zambia, there's basically two types of schools that students can attend, um, mainly talking about primary school here. There's government schools, and these are built by the government and operated by the government. They tend to be accessible. There are some government schools in rural areas, but they're the type of schools you might find like off the main road. And then there's also community schools. And community schools really have grown in the last decade or so. And what that means is often the school, the structure itself is built by an NGO or some funder that comes into a community. And often these tend to be in more rural areas. And, and builds a structure and then passes it on to the community to run. So the community is then tasked with raising them funds to pay a teacher or to find a volunteer teacher and get all the resources for the schools. So there's these two sort of types of schools in Zambia. And, um, you know, when we started the organization, we were really focused on doing what a lot of NGOs do, which is build these community schools and hand them over to the communities to run. But what we found was that without any resources, so without textbooks and ideas on what the curriculum should look like and management and funds and resources, to be honest, the quality of what was going to be schools was pretty poor. Um, So what we wanted to do when we first started was build these schools and, and hand them over to the community. And then we sort of evolved to how we thought about it and decided to focus more on what was going on inside classroom walls rather than the construction themselves. Um, and, and in general, the Zambian government is trying to figure out a solution for the education crisis really facing the country um, to try and improve the quality of community schools. Uh, what they're finding, though, is that the cost to convert all of these community schools into government schools is quite high. Um, so what we aim to be is really a, a solution that's in between. We're high quality, but we operate at a pretty low cost. So what kind of success have you seen, and, and how do you measure that success? I'm, I'm a teacher, and there's a million ways of, uh, that New York City is trying to measure success and drives us crazy a little bit sometimes. So what are you doing over in, uh, um, with these schools? And how, are you measuring success in the same, uh, the same way the government is measuring over there, or do you have your own versions of, of measuring that? Yeah, so the first, um, unlike New York City, the first standardized assessment in Zambia starts in grade 5. And by that time, to be honest, in terms of what's happening with students, a lot of students have either dropped out by that point or um, are attending but still don't know how to read and write, for example. Um, So when they get to that first standardized assessment, students generally score pretty poorly. Um, I think the last survey that was done across Zambia showed that 90% of students weren't meeting the desired standards in math and English. Um, And so... What we do is we have assessments that are done once every term. There's three terms in the Zambian school year. They're done at the end of the term, and they're created by mostly our teachers and teacher supervisors. Um, There's a representative from each school and each grade that come together to craft the questions based on the curriculum. And then those are graded at the end of the term and given out to students um, and sent home to parents as a sort of report card on how their students did. Um, So that's one way we do it. Um, And that's internally, but externally, we also had an evaluation done by American University, 
What American University did uh, across first and second graders is measure our students on the early grade reading assessment and the early grade math assessment. So those are the EGRA and EGMA tests that are pretty widely known in the international ed world. Um, so they measured our students on, on these two early, early assessments on reading and math. And then they also measured students in nearby community schools that weren't operated by us and nearby government schools. And what they found was that um, there's a number of benefits to our program outside of just the assessments. So parents really liked the programs that we provided. Teachers attended um, class more, more often in our schools than in other schools. Uh, student attendance and student motivation was higher in our schools than other schools. And uh, the, the progress, so the amount that students were able to learn over an 18-month period on the early grade reading and early grade math assessment was um, better than the government schools or, or the same as the government schools, depending on the subscale you looked at. Um, and all of that is able to be done. We operate at a cost of about you know, 70% less than the government schools. So what we were really trying to do is provide a low-cost solution to, to community schools and improving the quality. And what our evaluation showed was that we were able to do that quite successfully. That's amazing. So if someone at home is listening to this and they want to get involved, what kind of things are you looking for as far as other people helping out or, or people getting involved, volunteering or donations or uh, donation of materials? What kinds of things that uh, can people at home do to, to help support what you're doing? People can help out in a number of ways. Um, so the first is that we have about 50 staff members in Zambia and about two in New York. Um, really rely pretty heavily on the help of volunteers and interns uh, to run events, to help with fundraising, um, sort of everything in between in New York City. So we always year-round are hiring um, interns and volunteers in our New York office to provide internship opportunities in Zambia. So we have usually one to two interns living in the village and helping our staff in Zambia. And there's always positions posted for that as well. And then we usually have two sort of funding events a year. And the, the main one we have is called Best for Impact. And that happens every fall. And it's sort of a, a, a gala event where we have chefs from around the city each donate a course. And so it's, it's sort of a culinary gourmet menu. We have a silent and live auction. Um, but that event, you know, is a big coordination effort from us. So we are always looking for volunteers and interns to help get auction items, um, help coordinate the logistics of the event, help sell tickets. Um, so we, we usually have two sort of events a year, and we're always happy to have people help out for those. We also have something called Impact Advocates, where people fundraise for the organization in different creative ways. So we had a nine-year-old donate their birthday. We've had um, people sort of throw a barbecue in their home and it only costs us $3 a month to provide a quality education to one of our students in Zambia. So it's an amount that's really easy for sort of anyone to be able to help with. It's a cup of coffee. And um, so, you know, people like my, a nine-year-old can raise money just as well as, you know, 25-year-old in, in, in college or something. Um, so we really have had a, a sort of a range of people that have helped in, under our Impact Advocates program. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I encourage anyone to check out our job postings on Idealist or contact us directly if they're looking to be involved in, in, in any fundraising aspect. I want to let you go, but I want to ask you one more question. What is something that you've learned that maybe you could pass on to people in similar situations or working with uh, international nonprofits? And uh, what have you learned that you could maybe pass on to, to someone else doing something similar? Sure. Um, I guess my one piece of advice would be to be persistent and resilient. Um, the work is pretty tough and any little task can take so much longer than you anticipate. So for example, um, one of my trips last year, I was visiting the schools with our regional director and there was these desks that looked broken and I was sort of like, you know, what are these desks doing here? And he was like, oh, you know, we need to get them fixed, but um, you have to get the bolts to do that. And, and, and they were out of bolts in Katete, which is the nearest town. And so then we went to Chapada to get the bolts and they were sold out there, too. And, and it turns out that you had to go like one country over to, to Malawi to get these particular bolts to fix these desks. So so even like the simplest task wow. that you think should take, um, you know, like a couple hours or a half a day's work 
can take a long time. And I think being patient really goes a long way, but also being able to, to handle um, those types of delays with a little bit of grace and, and, and humor is is the one thing that can keep someone sane in the work. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's my one piece of advice. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking some time and speaking with me today. And uh, best of luck to, uh, to you and everyone uh, you're working with. Thanks so much, Bill. I really appreciate it. And that's it. So I certainly want to thank Rashma Patel and the whole Impact Network for uh, taking some time to speak with me today. And I want to thank you for listening and continuing to support the show. Uh, be sure to follow us on Twitter, at Podcast. Follow us on Facebook and check out our blog, thebillquinnpodcast.blogspot.com. And with that, I hope to see you very soon.